Thanks for having me. When you look at a bicycle, when you see one person riding it, you see all the mechanisms, and at once you understand how it works. Uh, and whether it's you know, a $100 Hafi or a $3,000 Bianchi, it doesn't matter. It's transparent design. And whether you're six years old or you're a triathlete, you learn to modify it. You add the training wheels, the lights. If you're in Cuba, you add motors. Some people add babies and flowers. Um, it's an inviting design that allows bicycles to basically be modified. We make, them our, we make, we make the bikes um, as, as we wish. And that same type of design sensibility uh, was present in the Wright Flyer. Um, when, they, when they flew in North Carolina, um, at once, same situation, the mechanisms were out there. Cat was out of the bag and it created a whole aerospace industry um, that many, many people followed. Medical technology is anything but transparent. It's black box. It's, it's, it's housed in complex engineering um, designs so that we don't understand, cloaked in housings. And the average patient and the average researcher sometimes and, and the average uh, healthcare provider doesn't understand it. So when they look at something as simple as a pulse oximeter, very few people recognize that at the end of the day, the business end of everything is about three components. A couple of LEDs and a sensor. When somebody wants to know if they're gonna have a baby, they go into a local pharmacy and they select a digital pregnancy test because it's what costs a little bit more and might be fancier, but at the end of the day, they don't re recognize that amongst those 25 parts, only one actually matters, which is the one that has the antibodies that bind to the um, HCG uh, antigens that now tell you you're gonna have a baby. But we don't understand that because these, de these devices were never designed to be understood by the people that, that use them, unlike bicycle design. When you go to a doctor's office, you're filled with these black boxes. They generally are not black, they're beige and off-white and aqua. Um, but when was the last time you had a fruitful conversation with your uh, physician about how that blood gas analyzer was working out? Um, it just doesn't happen. And we, and, and, and we let these machines poke us or we, we give something to the machines and we just take it for granted and we don't really ask um, how they work and why in some cases they're so expensive. Now, never, it wasn't always this case. Um, medical technology has a rich history of people that defied that black box, that didn't submit to it. Charles Dodder in the 1920s and 30s when he designed different types of heart catheters, he would use Volkswagen cable uh, wires and guitar string and all sorts of hardware store implements to prototype his devices and then it became a huge company called Cook Medical. Dr. Gibbons and the first heart lung machine in the 1940s and 50s would create what we now use every day in cardiac surgery and then he would give away the blueprint so other doctors could replicate it. The first balloon angioplasty was actually prototyped in a Zurich kitchen by a doctor called Andreas Grunzig who despite having been living in one of the best engineering cities in the world and having um, nearby access to engineering uh, colleges, he was just one of those people that was just simply out of the game. So from 11 p.m. at night to 3 a.m. in the morning after work in the clinic, he would prototype several dozen variations. And then he introduced the device into an IRB, got permission to test it on a patient, presented his work at Emory University, and changed the way we do um, cardiac care. And a lot of people know about Earl Bakken, who's created the wearable pacemaker in a garage, uh, and then that became Medtronic. The most recent example, because we work in diagnostics, is the case of a graphic designer who in 1969-68 walked into the chemical department uh, of her company and said, I have an idea for a home pregnancy test. And 
Margaret Crane essentially gave women a choice uh, for, for, for monitoring what they, their own bodies that they didn't have before. So our lab tries to look at these types of innovations that we've had in the past, and we try to bridge the makers and the DIYers and healthcare. Because we think that black boxes aren't healthy for medicine. We need more people participating in the design process. And we need it to be more open and so that more, more ideas can come together. And we define this, as Anna previously mentioned, as something called making health. And I'll be a little bit more academic here and, 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 and define it very specifically. It's not just about coming up with ideas. It is about looking at the tangible ways that individuals <coughs> shape, form, assemble, transform objects uh, with their own hands and nearby resources. And, it's in, and when we do it in healthcare, we actually end up with real stuff. Because at the end of the day, whether we like data, whether we like apps, whether we like digital health, healthcare, frankly, is a very analog experience. You get, you get well and you get sick by one of two modalities. You swallow something or something pokes you or you produce something that somebody else analyzes. And it's very much an analog process. So devices are, are and, 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 and substances are, are the drivers of, of, of modifying um, our, our health. Now, it's all fine and well. Why should we care about making it our own? It's something I get asked a lot. It's like, okay, well, leave it to the professionals. You've made your, your, your case about understanding, but somebody else should do that. Um, and the reason is, uh, there's, there's several, and I'll, and I'll go through three uh, amongst many that I think is important, especially for this crowd. The first thing that we've noticed in the last four or five years is a growing divide in digital health. I'm one of those people that, you know, we get the new iPad. Um, I don't upgrade the iPhone as much, but man, I'm jealous when somebody else walks in with the iPhone 6. Uh, and so it's not that I'm a Luddite. I work at a university full of nerds. Um, and we love our technologies. And, and it's like Christmas every day. Um, but, but, but when we look at how certain technology trends uh, in other domains have affected uh, that field, we see a stark difference. Um, this is a video that somebody uh, made that I love because it tells the story very, 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 very clearly. This was probably my dad's office in 1980. Um, and over time, you know what's going to happen, right? Uh, things become digital, things become more portable, and we no longer buy Rolodexes and, and physical globes. We have things like Google Maps, and we end up with a Mac, our wonderful smartphone, and our glasses, and everything has become virtual. And if you think about it, what is the most expensive app that you have today? Who who has an app that's more than $20? 10. Five. So if you turn around, there wasn't a lot. OK, um, 99 cents, probably the, the, bell, the bell curve. of. So it's a wonderful thing. We no longer buy $22 Rolodex refills. Everything's become vir uh, virtual, and frankly, um, mobile phones and things of that sort, the connectivity of devices onto portable computing has really done fantastic things for the average paper pusher. Now let's look at that same connectivity as applied to healthcare and medical technology. Let's look at my version, not as pretty, of the medicine cabinet of that video. The $2 thermo digital thermometer that I can buy on Amazon becomes a $29 to $35 uh, <coughs> thermometer simply because it connects over Bluetooth or over, in this case, not even Bluetooth, the, the um, mono jack to my smartphone. The $13 digital blood pressure cuff becomes a $169 uh, blood pressure cuff. The seven, this is one of the first devices I bought at MIT. Um, it was a really cute thermistor embedded inside a pacifier so you could tell if a baby was having fever. It was about seven bucks. And last, last year at um, CES, a startup launched selling the same thing for $40 because it connects to a smartphone. And one of my favorite ones are the smart pill bottles. You know, the lowly pill bottle that you probably get for free at Boots if you lost one um, becomes upwards of 150 or 
maybe $40 plus a 1995 monthly subscription to monitor that uh, pill bottle. And last time I checked, my grandmother, who's in fairly good health, still takes about five pill bottles uh, every month. So the notion that we should invest $1,500 just to see if grandma's taking her pill, to me, is ludicrous. Um, and we have m even more devices. This is a dispenser for multiple pills uh, for $800. And the problem is that sometimes these are the same devices um, that come from the folks that give us $700 juicers that also, by the way, yep, talks to your smartphone. So <laughs> what we're trying to do is recognize that, frankly, the same technology curves that make connectivity fantastic and affordable for the average office worker should make connectivity affordable for, for healthcare. There's no, there's no reason that, that that pill bottle says, I'm a pill bottle, so I'm going to be six times more expensive as opposed to, I don't know, I'm a cat feeder. Uh, because you'll probably buy a cat feeder cheaper than that $800 device. So what we do is we try to democratize medical technology. We respond by it by saying, um, this is a construction kit. We make construction kits for adherence. We make construction kits for those connected inhalers, for nebulizers that you can put together in about five minutes um, and with seven dollars of parts and, and it tracks the same type of nebulizers that you'd see in other places. We get nurses to, to show doctors how to do it. The other part that why we should care about DIY medical technology is the notion of taking back our data because all of those connected devices also keep the data and I've been paying a lot of attention to this in another domain. You know, farmers in Illinois today cannot fix their tractor because it's effectively they are breaking into software that's embedded into the tractor. Um, now, I don't know much about um, uh, farming. I do know a lot about coffee. This is how I make my coffee every day. But then we're moving towards an era where now we have DRM also in our coffee. And the worst machine known to history um, is, are, are these machines that are also DRM'd. And it's already happening in, in, in healthcare technology, whether it's smart inhalers or pill bottles or passive thermometers or EKGs that just conveniently store our data in their cloud. So at MIT, we started an initiative um, encompassing uh, facilities and courses and, and, and think tanks that looks at how do we focus on showing people how to generate devices that not only produce personal data, but produce it as a kit so that you can own your data and you can own the means of production of that device. So we started the first medical makerspace at MIT uh, in a medical school uh, with, our, with the HST program. We started a course. And there's nothing great better, better than teaching, telling an MIT student that um, you could do the same thing for half the price and you could do it cooler than everybody else. And so they start to do things like tracking orthopedic sensor uh, uh, braces for little kids that don't want to admit that they're falling because the orthopedic brace um, is not fitting well. So instead, we can put an accelerometer on it and a, and a very simple uh, kit, and we can tell when you're, you're, you're falling down and getting up. We didn't put it on, our, on a real five-year-old. We put it on an undergrad. Those are cheaper. And um, one day, I walked into the lab, and my undergrad was just all of a sudden walking and then falling, walking and then falling. And I got nervous. I thought he had some sort of um, oxygen uh, saturation issue. And no, they were just testing the prototype. Um, the last thing that I want to bring up is the, is the perfect storm of what happens when we don't understand these technologies. And that's in the case of what happened last year. Um, it was Hollywood's worst script come to real, uh, to real life. You know, every time you turned on the news, it was Ebola, it was Ebola, it was Ebola. And sitting in the lab, we noticed that the world responded with one of the largest shipments of black boxes known uh, to international aid. We shipped almost a, almost a billion dollars of aid, much of it in medical black boxes. One company alone got $247 million in, the, in instrumentation that today we do not know if it was effective or if it was even used. And everybody just said, it, it's a nice looking box. It must work great. Um, so we did several things. We already had actually a research project that was developing viral hemorrhagic um, fever diagnostics with um, Lee Gerke uh, at HST and, and Harvard Medical School. And we developed a 
nanoparticle-driven um, device that basically is a fancy pregnancy test that can detect all these viruses at the same time and gives us an RGB readout. But when we tried to deploy it, we realized there was a lot of regulatory hurdles and a lot of um, red tape associated with it. So we went back to our roots and we said, okay, why don't we do our own variation of open sourcing it and develop basically those same type of tests that Margaret Crane made, but pixelated versions of it. So we develop a construction kit because that's what we do. And in this case, a construction kit is, is, is for diagnostics. And when you put it together, you simply collect connect them like Legos. And what you're going to see is we add a sample. The sample interacts with nanoparticles. The nanoparticles form a line, just like your everyday uh, pregnancy test. But in this case, you can make it, and you can make it your own. And we can then match it up with cool markers for things like cancer biomarkers. This was based on uh, a paper that Sangeeta Bhatia published in PNAS a, a couple of years ago. But then we added our own flourish, and we said, well, we need a check for protein to make sure those biomarkers are reliable. And we did that in about 10 minutes after deciding that we wanted to, to verify that test. Um, we can test for metabolites in, in, in your blood to see if you've taken your medication. So the, the violet um, stains over there can test if a, if a tuberculosis patient has taken their, their medication. We don't know what people are going to make with these kits, and that's the point. We want to leave it up to a lot of people and trust that they are going to have their own imagination to forge and create their own inventions. Because when we do that, we won't have another situation like the black box epidemics of Ebola or the tractor versions of medical technology. We started something called the Open Diagnostics Initiative, so that in the same way that MIT open sources its course curriculum, we're doing the same thing for diagnostic assays. So now that Zika is the new um, uh, headline of the day, we're recruiting hundreds of labs in South America and giving them construction kits like this so that they can make their own without waiting for the WHO um, for, 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 for getting its act together this time around. And our hope is that the next generation is a generation that knows that great medicine comes from great tinkering. Thanks. Thank you. There's one very quick question, Jose. Yep. How long till you can make an organ on a chip? We're already brainstorming with Geraldine. <laughs> Just don't tell her investors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Inspiring story.